Isn't that a beautiful picture? Yeah. What do you notice about it? It, it connects two things. Manger and the cross. And it's important, <laughs> it's important to remember that when we think about the baby Jesus, we do not disassociate him for the work that he had planned on fulfilling and that he did fulfill, which is the finished work of the cross. Very, very important. So I've entitled this message from crib, from the crib to the cross. And what does that mean? And so that passage that we saw there in Acts chapter 13 says that Christ came to fulfill all the promises that were made. And he didn't fail. And I think all too often when we come to Christmas, we sort of uh, assess Christ's birth as merely the beginning of something that remains unfulfilled. And we don't believe that. We believe that Christ fulfilled his finished work. That's why Christ said what? It is finished. He fulfilled the sacrifice necessary. He was born to die. Jesus says, for this reason I was born. That every person who is of the truth hears his voice. It's very, very important because we have obviously commercialized the birth of Jesus to the point of where they don't even talk about it anymore. Does anyone recognize that woman? Is it your mom? <laughs> is, it, is it my mom? No. Uh -huh. My mom was prettier than that. Oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No disrespect. No, she's wonderful. Anyone ever heard of Dr. Georgia Harkness? She actually was the first uh, to have a full professorship at a United States seminary teaching theology. And uh, it, was, it was at, uh, oh, what's that called? Garrison, I can't remember. It's the United Methodist Seminary now. I think it was called the Garrison Bible Institute, but it changed to the Garrison uh, United Theolo or Theological Seminary. But she wrote a paper called Glory to God in the Highest. Glory to God in the Highest. And it's from that famous text where the angel says, glory, they're all crying, shouting with joy. Glory to God in the highest. Peace and goodwill toward those on earth. And that peace and goodwill was God bringing down peace to us through Christ. The Bible calls Christ our peace, Ephesians chapter 2. He is our peace who has broken down the middle wall of partition. So we were talking about that breakdown of the barrier between Jew and Gentile. And so when the Christmas message teaches us peace and goodwill, it's God's goodwill toward us. It's God's peace toward us. It's the exercise of what we call his good pleasure in Ephesians chapter 1 to the praise of the glory of his grace. Well, she writes in her paper, Glory to God in the Highest, these words. The Westminster Catechism, and I'll stop right there. As many of you may know, a catechism is basically a way to teach children and new believers. And oftentimes the way that they are accomplished is you ask the child a question and the child responds to that question. And one of the greatest, if not the greatest confession of faith, I believe, is the Westminster Confession, which those Presbyterians use. Actually, many of them don't even use it anymore, which is kind of sad. But she recognized, she's a United Methodist theologian. She recognized the value of teaching children from a very early age to take them away from their technology and get them into the beauty and love of Jesus Christ and his glory and his wonder, to teach them what Christmas and Easter really are, to teach them what Yom Kippur really was and what it means to us. The Westminster 
quoting from her, formulated back in the middle of the 16th century, asked the question, what is the chief end of man or humanity? And its specified reply was, read this with me if you can see it, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Can I get a hallelujah? Isn't that amazing? To enjoy God. To glorify him. That is our first goal as we think about Christmas, as we begin, as we talk about those in the Old Covenant and their hope for Messiah. That's what hope represents. They were under darkness and the shadow of death. And they were longing, oh, that salvation would come out of Zion. And what do we see Simeon doing? Lifting up, mine eyes have seen your salvation. Amen? They were longing to be redeemed. They were longing for the day when God would take away sin, when God would dwell among his people. It was prophesied so many times in Jeremiah and Ezekiel where God says, I will make a new covenant with them and I will set my tabernacle among them and I will dwell among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. That's what we are now. That's what Jesus accomplished. George was speaking to me yesterday about what we have that's so new. It's beautiful. We're new. We're a new creation. She goes on. This has often been smiled at. And in our Protestant churches today, we do not usually have catechisms with prescribed answers. If only she could see what has happened with the smartphone. <laughs> Yet the late Archbishop William Temple has pointed out that those church fathers had the sequence right. The glory of God comes first. That's what Christmas is about. Glory to God in the highest, right? It's about his glory. And then joy follows from that. The Westminster, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. When our life is about glorifying Jesus Christ, there's more joy. When we put our agenda in front of that, we always get discouraged. But it would distort the Christian message to aim to enjoy ourselves by glorifying God. That's not what it's about. The chief end is not to glorify ourselves. The chief end is to glorify God. And then out of that springs forth all the joy of what it means to be one of his children. It is God, not ourselves, who should have the priority, she says. Isn't that wonderful? And I hope that we would all remember this during this time. Hope. We see all four really, what I believe, in this wonderful Christian Christmas text, Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 79. This is John the Baptist's father. He couldn't speak there for a while. And then all of a sudden, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people. He has favored us. He's chosen to bestow his favor. That's his love. That's the love of God. And has redeemed them. That's what Christ did. He bought us back. He paid a price and he didn't fail. Amen. He paid the price. He got his merchandise. You ever thought of yourself as merchandise? You ever thought of yourself as an inheritance. Did you know that? Psalm 2 says, I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Through his death, he has inherited us. He inherited us. And we have inherited him. Christ is our inheritance. The Bible says the Lord is your lot and the portion of your inheritance. We have inherited him. He's inherited us. That seems like a pretty darn good deal if you ask me. He has raised up a mighty savior, not those of old who died, not those kings who would sometimes do well and sometimes fail and sometimes always fail. He raised up a mighty savior for us in the house of his servant David. 
And we say, What's, what does that mean? Savior from what? Well, they were used to being saved from nations. Save us from the Babylonians. Save us from the Assyrians. Save us from those darn Moabites, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> no, the Bible says, the Christmas story says, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their what? Sins. Sins. The true believers were not looking for salvation from a nation, from an enemy, from those Chinese, from those Russians, you know, like so many apocalyptic crazies today feel and expect. No, true believers wanted salvation from their own sins. They wanted redemption. They wanted to be accepted in the sight of God, finally. A mighty savior for us in the house of his servant David, just as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. They were filled with this hope, this expectation. When is Messiah going to come? When will I get to be with God in that holy place? They saw that high priest go in there once a year, but they could never go in. And then now, because of the work of Christ, we've been brought into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10, 18 through 22. That we would be saved from our enemies. You say, well, wait, come on. Isn't that the Russians, right? For those of you who were politically uh, aware during the Cold War or during World War II, isn't that rescue from the Japanese or from Mao Zedong? Nope, that's not the enemies they were referring to. The word of God, if you read the book of Psalms, the main enemies of God's people were those who would level false accusations against them, who would accuse them, the self-righteous Israelites, who would lay charges, who would try to bring them before them and stone them. They were always looking to find fault. That's why when the Bible, Jesus Christ died, the Bible says the accuser of the brethren, the false accuser, the serpent, the Pharisees, they, he is cast out. No one, Paul says, can bring a charge against you. No one can accuse you. They cannot bring up your past because of the blood of Christ. Those were the enemies. The Bible says, if, if you were with us, any of you visited the Wednesday night study in the book of Psalms, it says, you're going to save us from their contentious tongues. We're in that series, right? Those were the enemies. Paul called those Israelites the Pharisees. He said, these are the enemies of the cross. He wasn't talking about them as a national people. It's a philosophy of self-righteousness. It's a philosophy of self-righteousness that keeps people from coming through our doors or any church's doors. People don't want self-righteousness. They don't want hypocrisy. They want love. The Bible says what is desired in a person is kindness in Proverbs. That we would be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us. Thus, he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors or as Romans 15, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ came to confirm the promises made to the fathers. He fulfilled it. And it's beautiful. And he's remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham. Now, in Hebrews, it speaks about God's promise to Abraham. You see it especially in chapter 6 and in Romans chapter 4. And you know what it says? It says, God made this promise, and it says, it is impossible for God to lie. Amen? Amen. He made a promise. And it says this, because, you know how we say, oh, I swear to God, right? That means we're pretty serious. I mean, if you're going to say that, you better be serious, right? You better do or die, <laughs> right? The Bible says, because God could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. That's what it says in Hebrews. I swear to me. I swear to me, I'll never lie. I swear to me, I'll never leave you. I swear to me, 
I have removed your sins. I've redeemed you. I've bought you. You're my children. I swear to me, man, I would bank on that. When God swears by himself, bank on it. Hebrews chapter six, you read it. The oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us, this is the gift, that we being rescued from the hands of our enemies, their tongues, their biting words, their accusations. Again, remember what the word diabolos, devil, remember what it means? False accuser, slanderer. That's all those Pharisees did. That's what self-righteousness does. That we might serve him without fear. Again, I've quoted it many times from 1 John. Perfect love, what? Casts out fear. He says what? Fear not, for I have redeemed you. That's it. You could be under communism, fascism. You could be in a third world country. You could be in a foxhole. As Rosie said, God answers all our prayers. He just doesn't answer them the way we would like sometimes. But he says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. What do you say when you're in a foxhole? I have no fear. The Bible says, whether we live or whether we die, Romans, we are the Lord's. I have no fear. He's redeemed me. I've been bought with a price. It says, without fear in holiness and righteousness. The Bible says we are made totally holy in his eyes. We're totally righteous. We've studied that in depth from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Remember, he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we would become the righteousness of God. It's fulfilled. It's done. All our days. And you, child, Johnny, right? John the Baptist. He's speaking about John the Baptist, right? You will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Remember that? Prepare the way of the Lord. That's the Christmas text, right? John chapter, or Isaiah chapter 40. Make straight a pathway for our God. Come on, Jesus. Can you picture John the Baptist, the greatest of all the prophets? Here he comes. All right, everyone. God's coming. That's what it says. Behold your God. That was the prophecy. He's saying, behold the lamb, behold your God, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's all about Christmas and Easter and the cross. Amen. Amen. That's the Christmas story here. You will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation. And that's what he said. Behold the lamb of God, the perfect unblemished sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. Or as uh, the book of Hebrews says, he appeared once at the end of the age, the old covenant age, to cancel sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's Christmas. To give knowledge of salvation to his people, how? By the forgiveness of sins. Are you sick? Do you have cancer? Do you lose a loved one? Fear not, I've redeemed you. You're safe. It's okay. You're going to grieve, but at least God has accepted you into his presence and loves you. Praise God. It's not dependent on our feelings. Amen. (laughs) By the tender mercy, there's that wonderful word that we could all use a lot of in our lives, tender heartedness. It comes from recognizing how gracious he is. The dawn, one translation calls it the day spring from on high. Christ is the day star. Peter calls Christ the day star. We sing it. He's the lily of the valley. The what? The bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The day spring on high will break upon us, and he has to give light to those who sat in darkness. That was that period under the old covenant. The people, Isaiah 9, the Christmas text, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great what? Light. And what does Jesus say? I'm the light. I'm the light of the world. The one who follows after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We have it now. 
the light of the city of God. We are God's city, the city set up on a hill, let your light so shine. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Guess what? We are no longer in the shadow of death. We are in the light of Christ. And the psalmist, when he said that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that was the period under the old covenant. And Jesus had to experience that shadow of death as he carried on himself all of our sin and our darkness and shame. And in exchange, he gave us his life to guide our feet into the way of peace, which is next week. Amen.